So again, welcome to our fast e-sampler lecture today, the introduction to Italian language with Dr. Elena Caselli. Dr. Caselli, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you everybody for joining us today for our uh, mini lecture. Um, today, I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, words, sound and the basic rule of social interaction in Italian, which is really my first lesson during the course Italian 100. So this is the program for today. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to um, introduce some uh, pills of Italian language and culture, and I'm curious about what do you already know about it. Uh, then I'm going to start with my uh, lezione numero uno, so lesson number one, uh, regarding the topic I've just mentioned. Um, then we will have a um, brief um, uh, introduction about how my language courses work, as their method and structure. And then um, I would like to introduce you the World Languages and Literature Department, uh, which is a brand new department um, I'm working uh, in this, uh, this semester. And also uh, five good reasons why you should study World Languages and Literature. So the introduction of the department and the reason why it is a very good choice um, for you to, uh, to attend our programs. So let me start with a simple question. What do you already know about Italian language and culture? I'm sure many of you have some knowledge about Italy, Italians, uh, our food, our habits. Uh, there are around some stereotypes, which are uh, partly true. Uh, so if you have any information about Italian language, culture, uh, and uh, Italians in general, I would love to, to hear from you. I can see someone is typing in the chat, but I so can... We have pasta, we have Vivaldi, and perhaps more still incoming. Mm. So... Ciao! Speaking with your hands, allegedly. That's very true. That's very true. So yeah, we already have some answers that I uh, imagine. So um, here we are. Uh, Italian uses more than 250 hand signs to underline and reinforce the meaning of their words. That's very true. We speak with our hands all the time. Uh, Italian and also a meter to speak with our uh, with, with their hands. Um, in the past and in the future and in the present, just pointing at things, right? Um, that's very interesting. This is very, this is really part of our a way of communicating. And then uh, we have many dialects, probably you know that, uh, many dialects from the north to the south and they are very different from each other. So if you hear someone speak, um, someone that speak, uh, a language that has a, a certain kind of accent or different, completely different words, uh, it's probably someone in Italy that is speaking its own dialect. We can't understand each other if uh, we speak our own dialect and we are from different regions, sometimes from different cities. So we learn the standard language uh, here at SFU, the Italian standard language, which is based on the Tuscan dialect and which is the one, the language that we all speak understand uh, through the north, uh, from the north to the south of our peninsula. Uh, some stereotypes about food, like the very, very famous fettuccine alfredo and spaghetti meatball or garlic bread uh, are not Italian food. This is part of our culture uh, that you will, you will learn this, uh, this kind of information during the course as well. And then, uh, of course, probably you know that also Italian is an official language of the European Union. It's the language of culinary art. Uh, Italian has the most number of words for describing food. It's the language of movie industry, it's the language of music. If any of you have ever had the chance to take a look at a um, 
a music score, you might have seen words like piano, forte, adagio, allegro, all of them are adjectives that um, are Italian. And then it's the language of design, some special, special famous brands like Vespa, Alessi, Ferrari are uh, famous around the world and are made in Italy as one of the most recognizable brand all over the world. And also it's the fourth uh, language study in the world. Also very famous is our fashion industry. So Italian is the fourth most studied language in the world. How comes? It's probably it's not so difficult. Hmm? It's not a very difficult language. And it's not so different compared to English. Actually, Italian and English are quite similar because we share many words that have the same meaning and sound very similar. Uh, those are called cognates and those words come from Latin and our vocabularies, the English and the Italian one, they share a big part of these words, especially uh, related to science, mm? but also words like attenzione, which means attention, or dottore, which means doctor, mm? università, which means university, and of course connected to science and, you know, um, uh, academic subjects like biologia, biology, and economia, economy. Italian vocabulary is already part of your everyday vocabulary because all of you have at least pronounced uh, once in his life, um, in his or her life, the word latte or caffè or pizza. Mm? So it's there. Italian language, it's there already. And it's, it's especially a kind of vocabulary that you use um, to identify food. Uh, another thing that makes Italian not a difficult kind of language is the fact that uh, Italian has a very regular phonetic pattern. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, once you have learned how to pronounce one letter in Italian, that's it. You don't need to uh, learn how this letter sounds behave in different contexts. The letter A, the first letter of our alphabet, uh, is pronounced A all the time. Doesn't matter if it's placed at the beginning of the word, close to other kind of consonant, or uh, by itself as a preposition. So English has a very irregular kind of phonetic pattern. Sometimes the very same group of letters sounds absolutely different if you place them uh, inside a word or another one. In Italian, all the letters have only one sound and it's always the same sound every time. So that, that means that it's quite easy to learn how to read and pronounce Italian correctly. Uh, also, if you have, if you happen to have a background knowledge in French or Spanish, uh, you have a great advantage because the grammar are basically the same. So grammar, grammar rules of present in French and in Spanish are exactly the same like the ones that uh, organize and manage the Italian language. Um, Italian, French and Spanish together with Romanian and uh, Portuguese are Romance language, languages. So they come from the very same root which is Latin. So they share lots of vocabulary and they share uh, the same grammar structure. As I was saying, uh, you probably already speak a little bit of Italian. If you take a look at this picture here, the, the boot, the Italian peninsula, um, and you will see all these words, I'm sure you can, you can translate many of them. Hmm? So, uh, ciao, which it's also a very famous word that means hello and goodbye in Italian. And then we have um, 
Arrivederci. There's a, also a famous song that uh, back in the days was very famous um, about Arrivederci, Arrivederci Roma, exactly. Goodbye Rome. And then uh, the word caffè, spaghetti, pizza, um, mozzarella, benvenuti, which means welcome, are all words that are somehow part of our uh, book vocabulary uh, here in Canada or wherever you are uh, living in this moment. So you have heard uh, for sure and you have used some Italian words, but uh, have you ever heard someone speaking Italian? Uh, could you recognize if someone is speaking Italian or French, for example? Let's do a little experiment. I need to get out of this presentation. And here I'm going to uh, play an audio, um, an audio um, file and you will listen to six people um, uh, saying a very short uh, sentence. Uh, and I would like you to, to see if you can identify the languages they are speaking, especially I would like you to um, find out who of them is speaking Italian. Number one, two, three, four, five or six. You can type in the chat the number of the uh, sentence that uh, you think it's uh, Italian. Unità zero. Il bel paese. Il bel paese. Traccia uno. Ok, this is the number one. Uno. Pronto? Ah, ciao Giuseppe. Come stai? È da tanto che non ci sentiamo. Ok, number two. Due. Entschuldige, äh, ich suche den Seminarraum für italienische Literatur. Weißt du, wo der ist? Numero 3, number 3. 3. Buenos días, soy Pablo, el nuevo profesor de historia del cine. Number 4. 4. Ciao, me llamo María Vittoria, tengo 27 años y vengo de Vicenza. Adesso non che vivo però, perché sono andato a fare un dottorato a Barcellona. Five. Cinque. Salut Marina, ça va? Ça fait longtemps qu'on t'a pas vu en classe. And six. Sei. Ciao a tutti, mi chiamo Giuliano e vengo da una città meravigliosa, ricca di opere d'arte e dove si mangia benissimo. Okay, let's see, Bettina. So we report back. We have many for one. We have many for four. We have a couple now for six. We also have some for two. Okay, let's find out. So the number one is definitely Italian. Absolutely right. The number two? It, is this correct, Bettina? Is this German? It was, in, it was confusing when we heard the translation because I think uh, the German became clear, but I think there was a little bit more part to number one that was still played and that um, some of us thought it was number two. Oh, I so see. I think it was pretty clear that German was German and that Italian was Italian. It was but... Italian, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, number three was Spanish. And number four was Italian, but was a... a um, an Italian uh, less um, standard than usual. It actually was a dialect from the north. Mm? The difference was quite um, uh, clear compared to the number one. This is number five, which was French, and then the number six. Again, Italian with an accent, particular kind of accent from the south of Italy. So if you can listen again to the audio, we will see how different are the dialect and the pronunciation of some kind of words 
for you, of course, it's still, still very new, but you are, I'm sure you are able to recognize the difference between one and uh, so number one and four. Al dente uno. Ok, go. Il bel paese. Traccia uno. Uno. Pronto? Ah, ciao Giuseppe. Come stai? È da tanto che non ci sentiamo. Ok, this is Italian. Ok? Ciao Giuseppe, come stai? This is the standard language. Very clear. No accent, basically. Due. Entschuldige, uh, ich suche den Seminarraum für italienische Literatur. Weißt du, wo der ist? Tre. Buenos días, soy Pablo, el nuevo profesor de historia del cine. Okay, and this is the number four. And if you, if you can uh, keep in mind the sound of the number one, you can now really um, detect the different the differences. Quattro. Ciao, mi chiamo Maria Vittoria, ho 27 anni e vengo da Vicenza. Ho 27 anni e vengo da Vicenza. This is not Italian, or, or yes, it is, but it's a dialect, so the, the, the accent is very, very different and the pronunciation also sometimes is. Adesso non che vivo però, perché sono andato a fare un dottorato a Barcellona. Ok. She's using also different words. Ho 27 anni e vengo da Vicenza. Adesso non che vivo però, perché sono... Adesso non che vivo però, which is again not Italian, because in Italian would have been adesso non ci vivo però, which is, means I'm not living there anymore. So these are the differences between dialect and standard Italian, different tone, different accent, sometimes different words. The last, the last um, track, uh, is Italian, but with another accent. Let's see. Let's hear. Sei. Ciao a tutti, mi chiamo Giuliano e vengo da una città meravigliosa, ricca di opere d'arte e dove si mangia benissimo. Okay, this person here is using all the correct words, uh, all the standard Italian words, but with a special accent, uh, I believe from Sicily. Vengo da una città meravigliosa, with a O, very open O, uh, which uh, in the standard language would have been meravigliosa. So again, it's about also the sound of the vowel, the accent, the words, so different regions, different provinces, different cities sometimes, and different uh, way of speaking. But again, we have our common language, which is the standard Italian based on Tuscan um, dialect, which is the one that we are going to study and uh, learn during our uh, courses here at SFU. So this was our exercise, again, Italian 1, 4 and 6. As, um, as anticipated, Italian is kind of easy because the phonetic rules uh, that um, uh, are at the base of our language are very, very regular. So let's go over uh, a couple of them, which is, again, uh, really uh, straightforward because there are only uh, a few sounds that you have to keep in mind. For the other, um, it's really uh, so similar compared to English that it's not really not a big deal. So. Um, vowels, first thing first. Vowels are probably the most tricky part because they are different compared to the vowels that you use in English. Their sound, I mean. So for the first letter of the alphabet, the sound is A, ah, like in father. So it's not A at all. It's always A. Ah, this is the sound. Then for E, the second vowel, the sound is the way the, the one that you have for elephant. So it's a could be a little bit open like e, but uh, this is it's not e, never. And then for the third one, uh, the sound is e, like in peak, so it's not i. 
uh, and then O, it's O, and U is uh, U, not U. So like in quadrangle, for example. So this is the, the sound that you need to um, pay more attention to, the vowel sounds. And then we have um, this G, sorry, I'm going to say that in English, the CG rule. So we have these two letters, the C and the G, uh, that uh, change their sounds uh, depending on what kind of vowel they are followed by. So uh, here I put some example. So the J, uh, the G has a, a soft sound like a gelato every time you have the E or the A right after. The CH, the, sorry, the C, so the CH in Italian has a soft sound again every time you have E or A after it, so the I or the E after it, like in ciao. So it's not G, it's not K, but it's J and CH. I put down here these two examples because these two words are very familiar to you. So every time you find these letters followed by E or I, so A or E, you remember gelato and ciao and you will know how to, uh, to handle this. Uh, then G and C, when they are followed by A, O, or U, or H, they have a hard sound, which means that they sound like G and K, so like gate and K, so basically. So, for example, uh, the word like gatto, that means cat, is G plus A, so it's hard. It's not gatto, but gatto. And the C plus A, another example, can be like um, casa, that means house, and it's a K sound. So these are the two letters that have uh, a double nature. Let's say that they can have a soft sound, they can have a hard sound. Uh, it depends on what comes after them. But all the other letters of the alphabet, they have only one kind of sound. The special sounds in Italian, which are really special because it's hard to find them in any other languages, um, are three. The first one, and again, I'm sure you are already familiar with this sound, is the GN sound. So, ny sound, like gnocchi or lasagna. Hmm? So, GN. It doesn't sound like j or n, but it sounds like GN. Ny. This is special. This is a combination that makes a different sound, not like a sum of um, letters. And then we have gli which is, um, could be a definite article or could be, uh, you know, a group of letters that you can find in a word as familia, which means family. And it's very, very hard to pronounce. It takes a while to do that. Uh, you have to smile and push your tongue on your upper molar, like you are scrubbing some peanut butter from them. And, sm and again, smiling and say familia. Mm, you can try it. I can hear you, but you can try. <laughs> and, um, and the third one is the combination of S and C, which is sh. This is the sound, like in she. Mm? So when you have S uh, plus C with E and A, the sound is sh sciare, which means to ski, and scegliere, which means to, um, to choose. All the other letters of the alphabet sound exactly the same like the English one. The L sounds like L, the F sounds like F. So very same. Only the CG has this double nature, and then you have this three um, group of letters you have to keep in mind because their sound is very, very peculiar, connected to our, to our language, connected to Italian. So that's it. And again, these patterns are extremely regular. You, you can't find the same letter that have a different sound. All the letters have one sound and the same sound as 
um, replicated in every kind of combination that you can find in, in the world. So really, really uh, easy. Uh, I think that is very important when you read and pronounce Italian language is that you have to pronounce every single letter. So do not rush, do not skip letters. Um, again, as beside these three uh, above mentioned examples, there are no uh, letters that have a sound that you have to contract or you know you have to uh, change somehow. So it's super important in order for uh, your interlocutor to understand you, that you pronounce correctly every, every single letter, especially do not drop the final A, the final E, which is really, uh, you know, a, a strong temptation that um, English speakers have. Uh, don't do it because the final, the finals in Italian uh, tell us a lot tell us about the gender, the number, the subject involved in the action. So it's cru they are crucial for us to, to understand. So the very first lesson in my Italian 100 course um, is about the alphabet, uh, the uh, phonetic patterns, and the formal, informal way of speaking, which at the beginning could be kind of a challenging uh, topic, but it's super important. And basically all the books report this topic as the very first in their very first chapter. So um, let's, let's see uh, what it's uh, about. So uh, in Italian, we have two ways uh, in which we can address someone during a direct speech. A direct speech means that I am I'm talking directly to someone else, okay? So not about someone else, but directly to someone. In English, you have the you hmm, in way to address someone. How do you do, um, what are you doing or stuff like that? So you use the you in the formal and in an informal situation. So you use the you when you speak with your family members and you use you when you speak with your professor, with your boss at work or with a, a perfect stranger um, down the street. In Italian it's not like that. We have two different ways of managing our social relationship, let's say that, and two different pronouns we have to use. Uh, connected to these two different pronouns we have different verbs also, we have different words and way of greeting uh, someone, depending on the fact that we are in a formal or in an informal situation. So, um, when do we use the formal? Every time we speak to someone we have never met before, or to someone that is older than us, or someone that is in a higher job social position compared to us. So uh, for example, if you go to a, I don't know, a coffee shop and you want to order for a coffee, you don't say ciao, uh, voglio un caffè. You can't, <laughs> it's very rude. You have to use the formal way. So the greeting is different, it's not ciao, definitely is buongiorno. And you can't use the to the you with the waiter if you ask for something. You have never met him before or even if it's not part of your family, it's not your friend. Uh, so you have to use the formal. The informal is the way in which you can speak directly to someone uh, that you are very uh, familiar with. So family members, friends, or if you want to uh, address someone that is much younger than you, uh, like a children, like children, for example. Also among students, it's absolutely common. Uh, all of them are in the very same kind of age, uh, same situation, kind of a homogeneous group. It's normal using an informal way of speaking among young people. But for example, among colleagues, uh, in any kind of work environment, the formal way of speaking is the one 
that you definitely need to use at the beginning of this relation and that if you get familiar with this person and this person allows you to use the informal and vice versa then you can switch to the informal way of speaking otherwise the formal is the correct way of uh, managing a formal relationship so um, are these distinctions very important yes they are because we perceive uh, the lack of um, formal uh, way of speaking uh, toward us uh, like a very disrespectful kind of uh, way uh, of you know managing a relation so yes it's important to use the formal when it when it's time to use it and the informal is always welcome once you are acquainted with someone and uh, among your friends and stuff like that so if you can take a look at the um, at the comic strips here uh, I don't know Bettina I can see the um, you and the column of other but can you I don't know can I move this I'm not able to move the column in front of the um, comic strip Okay. We see the entire comic strip, but it's relatively small. Okay, perfect. We do. We do see it. It's not a problem. <laughs> okay, just a sec. Let me. Okay. Okay. I, I can read them. It's exactly the same, the same comic strip. So um, I'm going to read for you the first row and then the second one. So the first row, uh, it's clearly an informal situation to me because uh, at the very beginning the first balloon you can see, you can uh, see is the first word is ciao ciao is very informal so you can't use it informal situation but in the informal ones so ciao alessia come stai which means uh, hello alessia how are you doing come stai and she answers, bene, grazie. E tu? Tu is the pronoun, uh, the equivalent of you in English. And uh, this is the informal pronoun. So every time you use the tu, uh, the situation is informal. And so Alessia here, she's answering bene, which means well. Uh, grazie, which means thank you. E tu? And you and the uh, the other person answers non c'è male not bad second picture ti presento un mio amico ti presento I introduce you so the T is a variation of the two pronoun that for now you don't have to uh, think about but uh, um, let's um, look at it as a formula okay ti presento i introduce you un mio amico um, ciao come ti chiami come ti chiami means what's your name come ti chiami t again is the variation of tu and it tells us that this is an informal way of speaking mi chiamo gianni piacere mi chiamo means my name is Gianni is the name and piacere means nice to meet you and then Alessia is leaving scusate devo andare ciao excuse me I have to go bye again ciao very informal ciao a presto okay ciao again and a presto see you soon the second row first picture first word buongiorno which means good morning buongiorno could be used also in the uh, informal situation I, I say buongiorno to my children in the morning uh, but it's also the way in which you address someone formally mm? it, it means good morning so buongiorno dottoressa monti come sta so buongiorno dottoressa monti a uh, dr monti it's very common to address people when it's formal with their title. Um, come sta? How are you? Can you see the difference 
compared to the first uh, picture, first balloon. Come stai? And then come sta? The verb is the same. How are you? But the first one is conjugated for tu. And the second one is conjugated for lei. Lei is the pronoun. That the, it's written L-E-I. Uh, is the pronoun we use to speak in the formal with everyone. Masculine, feminine, singular subject, no matter, uh, doesn't matter, but this is the pronoun we use. So uh, instead of saying come stai, conjugating the verb for the singular uh, second subject, uh, we say come sta, and the verb changes. Molto bene, grazie, e lei, you can see the difference also compared to the second balloon in the first picture. The first was bene, grazie, e tu, informal, and the other one, molto bene, very well, grazie, e lei, the pronoun we need to use for the formal. Non c'è male, grazie. Not bad, thank you. Second picture. Le presento l'ingegnere Verdini. Again, you can see the difference, right? First balloon, second picture of the first row. Ti presento. The T as a variation of tu. And uh, second picture, second row, le presento. Le is the variation of lei. I introduce you, uh, Ingegner Verdini. Um, I know it sounds pretty weird, but it's uh, Ingegner Verdini, it's the title. Uh, and then uh, this person introduced uh, herself using her last name, Monti, piacere di conoscerla. Hmm? Instead of uh, come ti chiami, piacere Gianni, she introduces herself like, nice to meet you. My name is, my last name is Monti. And then molto lieto. Molto lieto is another um, more formal way of uh, saying piacere, but also piacere could be used in the formal situation. Last picture. Scusate, ho un appuntamento. Arrivederci. So excuse me, I have an appointment. Uh, goodbye. And then arrivederla. Buona giornata, instead of ciao, which uh, was mentioned in the third picture, first row. So these are two different ways in which we speak depending on the situation we find ourselves in. The first is very informal among young people, also introducing a new, new friend, uh, even if this person that never met before, uh, the situation is informal, they can keep it informal. Uh, in the formal situation, all of them are, you know, adapting their uh, vocabulary and their grammar to the formal situation. So, uh, looking at these two um, uh, representations, uh, could you tell me, could you type in the chat uh, what are the correspondent words for the formal situation given the ones that you can see in the informal situazione informale you have this short list of words that you have uh, in the first um, situation the first row and then you have the situazione formale so the formal situation uh, represented in the second row could you find the correspondent formal uh, way of this um, five uh, expression. If you can, please type them in the chat. We also have in the chat, just waiting for um, somebody to type perhaps the correspondent expressions into there. Of course, in Spanish and in French, we have similar distinctions with uh, tu et vous in French and with uh, tu and usted in, in Spanish. People are hesitant and not typing just yet. <laughs> no worries, no worries. 
it's okay. I mean, this is an exercise, a very easy exercise that we do in class when we are uh, talking and, you know, uh, covering the topic about formal and informal. So um, I believe you can definitely uh, detect, um, you know, the correspondent in expressions. And also you can get an idea of how, you know, we um, assess you know, the, the information that um, students process during the, during the lesson, just to give you an example of how uh, the course works uh, online and uh, it used to work like that offline too. Okay. Okay, speaking of how our uh, courses, language courses work, I can't really speak for all my colleagues, but I think this is a very, uh, a fair example of um, how we are adapting our um, pedagogy, let's say that, uh, to the remote environment. All of my courses this semester, and of course it's going to be uh, the same the next one, uh, are um, organized as, as follow. So there is an sync async structure, a flipped method, and a blended approach. What does this word mean? <laughs> okay, so the sync and async, it means that uh, instead of having two lessons uh, a week, we um, have only one lesson and we call it the synchronous time. So the time in which me and my students, we meet all together online. And then the other lesson, the one that we are not um, doing together is the asynchronous time. During the asynchronous time, my students, they prepare um, they study, they cover, they read by themselves a few topics in order to come prepared to class and practice with their classmates and with me. Because when it comes to language, actually, it is all about practice. So we are using our uh, live online lesson to practice mostly. Uh, and uh, the asynchronous time is for my students uh, to, um, accordingly to their agenda, which is really, really, really convenient, to cover some topic by themselves. This synchronous, asynchronous uh, organization allows the students to basically decide when they study uh, as long as they can prepare to class for the following week. Uh, the flipped class. The flipped class means that um, you students, you are in charge of your own learning somehow. So it's not as instructor uh, giving information one way from us to you, but it's you that start covering topics, it's you that raise your questions, it's you that find out connection, and then it's us facilitating this process and practice with you and correct, of course, with you what is not uh, on the right track but um, it's very, very engaging. This kind of, you know, um, this kind of uh, approach that works like the other way around compared to the uh, previous one is, um, is really, really uh, rewarding and interesting and engaging. Um, also, during our online meeting, uh, you will work a lot with your classmates in groups, um, you will learn from your peers, and uh, it's always uh, based on tasks, so you will learn things that are really useful for you uh, in terms of, um, you know, interaction, a real interaction in your, in your life, uh, so it's it's interesting, you know, it keeps you uh, focused on the, on the purpose of the course, which is speak Italian, right? So, and use, use Italian in your everyday life. I mean, when you travel, basically, mostly, but probably you have the chance to speak to someone in Italian too here, maybe your family or, or you know, your, your grandparents. Um, the blended approach, it means that, um, you have uh, a regular uh, classic um, 
learning tools at your disposal. So you have a book, you have a teacher, uh, you have the slides, you have some classic additional material, but also you have lots of online resources uh, that are, you know, dedicated portal or resources that I personally collect and select for my students and um, put online. We are, work through Canvas a lot for, you know, discussion boards or um, uh, providing you with further information or material or link or video or so there's lots lots of material that you can uh, rely on when it comes to to study uh, a language i would like to introduce now uh, our brand new uh, wll department um, so world languages and literature let me go to the website and i like to share with you my screen. Here we are. Okay, so we are, uh, we proudly offer nine uh, different languages here, nine different language courses, as you can see. Uh, Japanese, Arabic, Persian, Punjabi, Italian, Spanish, um, German, um, and uh, and it's 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 great. I mean, you you can you can learn many different languages, and you also can attend um, um, literature courses, which are connected to the different languages you can potentially study at the department. If you want more information, please visit our WLL um, department website uh, that you can find inside the SFU uh, website. I'll leave that to my... Okay. So, um, when, it, when someone asks us, um, so why should I study another language? Why should I study uh, world literature? What, what, what does it give to me? Uh, the thing here is that we need to be very, very well aware that not everything happens in English <clears throat> at, uh, in the world. So uh, it's, <clears throat> it's very, very uh, helpful to get different points of view to understand others uh, without the necessity of being um, translated or to translate constantly because many things can be lost in translation. Um, if you can study, if you choose to study world literatures and languages together or separately, it's not that you have to take them together, but um, this is this is something that can really really support uh, your uh, learning style in in any field because it's something that trains your mind in um, in understanding in uh, interpreting the reality. Uh, it will help you uh, in developing cross cultural competences and language abilities, which are actually hard skills in terms of. Um, no market labor. So um, now everywhere uh, people are looking for uh, employee that can speak at least two languages and uh, people that also have the ability of being um, connected to multiple culture uh, and they have the ability of being uh, able to read other cultures are also people that are extremely resilient and open-minded which is uh, are extremely useful and uh, appreciated skills in terms of um, in terms of um, job market uh, also looking at different uh, cultures looking 
being a different point of view, understanding others, uh, fosters empathy and imagination, which are ability that uh, will be with you forever, will uh, start, can start here or can be fostered here, but will accompany you for the rest of your life and will make you a lifelong learner, will make you uh, people that can think uh, differently and can respect others and take the most of you know uh, the different uh, world that is outside here um, of course you will learn how to be able to see the world from different point of view and understanding it better because looking from one perspective gives you a very partial you know, picture of what is going on in the world right now, what was going on in the past, what will go, will go on in the future. But if you say seated in one point, you can suggest the part of the story. If you are able to move your seat to stand up and walk right on the other side of the room, you will see a very different perspective. You will see very different things. So this is what it means to know another language to understand another culture so and here i'm going to uh, finish my my uh, short speech there are at least five good reasons to study world languages and literature the first one and it's related to a very um, very practical kind of matter. You won't find any high profile job in any field whatsoever that asks for one language only on your CV and uh, two or three languages, the knowledge of two or three languages are not uh, considered an asset hmm? from you know, the business uh, to um, kinesiology, no matter more languages do you speak the better studying this kind of subjects will really help you to be able to think outside the box and being more open-minded and resilient which are characteristic really really in demand now especially also as we're saying you can become you will become a lifelong learner, curious, engaged, capable, uh, and you know, um, of experience um, in a very in in a, in a more deep way. Uh, cultural otherness. Anybody can experience cultural otherness, but how many of us can really connect to this difference? Can really engage with these differences, can really appreciate these differences. Uh, being exposed to multiple culture, multiple languages will help you in become uh, interested, curious, empathic toward other cultures because it's a matter also of training, not only uh, attitude. Also, uh, which last but not least, looking at others, studying others, um, engaging with others helps you in understand yourself better, in questioning your everyday pattern, your behavior, and it will help you in develop a greater self-knowledge and self-understanding, which is, I believe, a quality that it's, it has no price. It will be with you for the rest of your life. It will help you in really managing any kind of situation in your life, academic, uh, in, at university or in your real life, mm -hmm. knowing yourself because you know each other, you know the others. It's something that really uh, open your mind also about yourself as, as a, a unique uh, human being. This is the end of my lecture. And now, if you have any question, I will be glad to, to answer. Grazie a lei, dottoressa Caselli. So thank you very much for the presentation. I already put into the chat a couple of minutes ago um, an invitation to anyone. If they have any burning questions, you can, of course, also email us. 
Um, and the first question is already coming in. Yes, perhaps, Dr. Caselli, you could mention uh, courses in other languages that are offered at SFU. There are a number of courses offered. Uh, in, in languages? Yes. Oh, yes. Which other languages? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, as I was saying when, when, when I was showing you the website, uh, there is a Chinese, a Japanese, a Persian, um, Arabic, um, Spanish, um, German, uh, of course, Italian, and I'm forgetting someone here. I think we also have modern Greek. Modern Greek, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, it is, it is indeed, in fact, the advantages now of having our, having the languages combined, so having this new Department of World Languages and Literatures allows us um, in the department to show uh, the richness that we have. I would also not underestimate, in fact, the language knowledge among our studentship, who bring many, many more languages to it. And I know that the department is currently thinking about how can we recognize this richness and this knowledge of our students who are there. Now, another question would be, uh, would it be accurate to assume that Italians in the South are more animated when they speak and use more gestures than Italians in the North? Is that accurate? It is. It is accurate. That's very true. And uh, um, the diet from the South are uh, very different compared to the ones in the North and they are very connected in terms of vocabulary and grammar, actually, to uh, Spanish language. So very caliente, let's say that. And uh, the usage of the hands are also more uh, common. And probably it's because, this is a theory, because there are no uh, proof for that, but it's probably because the populations in the south of Italy were more in contact because of um, um, their, uh, their business with the uh, um, Mediterranean Sea's country, different countries, uh, they were more in contact with people that were at the time spoken different languages and in order to be understood and understand, uh, they used their hands to enhance the meaning of their words to, to better communicate with others that were you know, foreigner uh, business uh, people that tra used to travel uh, in the Mediterranean Sea and have this contact with population from Naples to uh, Palermo, for example. Hence the importance, in fact, in a, if particularly in a language class, of having at least a visual contact, even better than having a face-to-face -face contact. And I think we're all longing in, in getting back to this face-to-face -face contact. I'm looking at the time. I believe that we have come to the end of our lesson today, our, our Italian lesson. Thank you very much again, Dr. Caselli, for opening up this picture into the world of Italian the world of Italian that is very much already around us, um, but that very often we do not realize. So at least next time you would know how to pronounce my name, how to pronounce Dr. Dr. Caselli's name, how to pronounce Gagliardi way that is leading up to Burnaby Mountain and how to order your espresso or uh, I don't know, your pizza in the next pizza shop. So thank you to everyone for having participated. I very much appreciated you taking the time and uh, I wish you uh, a fantastic uh, rest of the afternoon. Have a good day. Bye-bye.